Hello and welcome. Well, the uh, injunction at the moment is still very much to stay local. And that's exactly what we will be doing over the next uh, few minutes. We go on a slight journey, though. We're going over the bridge, over the suspension bridge, to the other side, to wonderful and remote North Somerset. And not too far from the far end of the bridge is Nightingale Valley, the top entrance to Nightingale Valley, which, by an amazing coincidence, was where my parents had their very first date back in the day. Nightingale Valley is on National Trust land uh, in Lee Woods, and it, if you're not familiar with it, uh, winds down slowly by way of a path through the valley, which is very lovely and very scenic, towards the river, towards the uh, cycle path that goes out towards Pill. And for a lot of the year, it's very peaceful, even in lockdown times. There are moments of great wonder and great beauty there. The poem that we'll be reading later on is from a cycle of poems called Beauty by the poet Catherine Charnley, who we've been journeying with over the last few weeks. And it's called In Nightingale Valley. It's clearly written in the place that we've been thinking about. It contains a really interesting phrase. She talks about resting on a tree trunk to just contemplate and delight in the peace and the wonder, although she can hear the sound of the city in the background. And this is the phrase, communion comes easily. That sense that close to nature, we are close to the beating heart of God. And an awareness of God's presence and God's love does come when we take time out in creation a lot more easily than it can at other times. And Catherine Charnley contrasts that with that persistent hum over on our side of the suspension bridge, the Bristol side, and thinks of the city as potentially a place where communion is harder. She's obviously thinking of those pre-lockdown dates when the city centre looked not a little unlike this. I think the woman in that car there is uh, remarkably patient looking at her face. Uh, that is the end of St Augustine's parade if you didn't um, gather it. Communion comes difficult. Let's hear the poem. Nature embraces. Like a lover, she leans her softness through the tall trees, dew-lapped and glistening in the June sun. They gather their beauty over this precipitous path far from the rush of traffic, fecund and wet with aureoles of dazzling buttercups. Down there is water, and beyond the insistent hum of the city. Here there is birdsong fluting through the silence. Communion comes easily propped on a rotting tree trunk. There is the wrestling, hunting for God in tower blocks and concrete, where no sun shines. But it's complicated. It's complicated because there is a vision of God in the city. The psalmist and many of the people mentioned in the psalms and for whom the psalms were written were always journeying to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus himself, towards the end of his life, journeys 
to Jerusalem. He journeyed as an adolescent to Jerusalem. There is something in the city that also attracts, otherwise people wouldn't, would they travel to places like Florence or Paris or Venice or Vienna to enjoy the city. Cities can be a place of communion as well, although it may not quite be so easy. And here we have unexpected joys on our doorstep. The, uh, the botanical gardens, one of Bristol's best kept secrets in the city. And it's also complicated because there can be immense want and immense poverty and lostness in the countryside. Perhaps when we have those botanic gardens times, those tree trunk times, times perhaps by the sea, perhaps uh, in a wood, we can reflect that in the narrative of scripture, humanity started in a garden and ends in a city. But it's a redeemed city, a city made wonderful and perfect by the God who built it and who calls his people to inhabit it in community, which we try to model then we day by day with each other. It's a heavenly city, but a city nonetheless. And yet it is also, as a redeemed city, a city full of greenery and delight. It's a perfect redemption. Because nothing is beyond the possibility of redemption. No one, no one person is ultimately beyond the possibility of redemption. And that's worth contemplating in Nightingale Valley or elsewhere. Listen to this passage from uh, chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no lamp or light of sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign for ever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. I'm going to leave you with a picture of that short scripture passage. Leave you with the great uh, artist, writer and uh, reformer, William Blake. It's called The River of Life. You can see it in the Tate Gallery in London, uh, when you're allowed to. And it's, I think, a lovely picture. Obviously, in Blake's mind's eye, he was a great lover of London, actually, although he saw its difficult side. A picture of delight, of the healing river, the healing tree, the city, people just popping out of their doorsteps for a chat. Angels and heavenly beings and healing and beauty. My word. That's something to reflect on. <laughs>